And welcome to this James May's Head Squeeze Hangout with the European Space Agency. I'm space physicist Martin Archer coming to you live from Imperial College London and it is my very pleasure to once again say hello to ESA astronaut Paolo Nespoli who's live in Rome. Hello Paolo. Hey Martin, uh, nice, uh, nice being with you again. It's fantastic uh, to have you on board with us again, Paolo. Now, today is a, is a special day because going on right now, um, Luca Parmitano, um, ESA astronaut at the ISS, is doing an EVA, an extravehicular activity, which to you and I means a space walk. It's actually been six weeks till the day that the Valare mission launched to the International Space Station, where we first talked to you, Paolo, all about what life on the International Space Station is is uh, like and it's going to be a great pleasure to find out what spacewalking uh, is like today. Now you might have been watching the live feed when it all kicked off at 12.15 British summer time. Um, then that means you'll know that Luca is all in white whereas you've also got NASA's Chris Cathy who's got the red bands on. That's how you can tell them apart. Uh, and we're going to be talking all about these and finding out lots of uh, stuff from Paolo. You can send your questions to us live. Just use the hashtag ask an astronaut. But we've got some people um, on with us right now as well. We've got a bunch of people from the internet International Space University Summer Program in Strasbourg. Um, also joined from Imperial College, we have Dr. Simon Foster and David Lawrence. Um, let's go to our first question, Paolo. Um, given that the spacewalk is going on right now, you know, how is everything actually going? Well, uh, Martin, it looks like everything is under control. They got out uh, at about uh, uh, 11.50 or 12.50 actually, European Central Time, and it was an hour early for you in the UK, uh, exactly on time, and uh, things have been uh, going on pretty pretty smoothly. Uh, they had a little bit of uh, delay at the beginning, but this was on Chris Cassidy when, uh, when they were split in doing two different tasks. Uh, Chris had a little bit of uh, trouble in uh, uh, removing a bolt uh, from uh, one of the boxes, but then everything else uh, went fine, and Right now, um, things are going uh, according to schedule, and uh, everything is go. As a power, could you just remind us, you know, what is the, the purpose of this particular spacewalk today? Well, there were uh, multiple purposes. This one, uh, this spacewalk today was one of the uh, roughly two spacewalks uh, uh, that are carried out uh, um, every year in order to take care of tasks uh, that have accumulated, little tasks they have accumulated here and there. Uh, usually if there is an emergency on station, then the crew goes out for an emergency spacewalk. But if there is no emergency, just regular tasks, uh, little things that break out here and there, or things that need to be changed, then uh, periodically, and it's about twice a year, uh, they actually do a regular maintenance uh, spacewalk. Today, this is one of them. And they're going to exchange uh, uh, boxes. Uh, one is a, a radio, actually a, a space to ground a receiver and transmitter. They're going to retrieve uh, some of the experiments that were put out there uh, two years ago. Uh, they are going to move uh, some grapple bars uh, that are going to be used later in another EVA to work with the, some of the radiator. Uh, they move, uh, they're going to move a failed uh, camera. Uh, and then they're going to put some cables uh, uh, in order to uh, have uh, internet signal going from one side to the other, from, from one side to the other of the station. And uh, the last two tasks will be one, to put a cover on, at the front part of the station. There was the docking uh, mechanism for the shuttle, has been there unused uh, for a couple of years, so they decided to protect it with a cover. And last uh, thing that they are, they are going to do is to go over IMS, which is uh, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, it's a big experiment sitting out there in the truss. They're going to go there and take some pictures to have a survey and see how is it doing after two years of being in space. Wow, it sounds like they've got a lot of work to do out there. <laughs> Um, well, Martin, that... you know, when, when they, do, they do an EVA, they actually try to put as much as possible in there because EVAs, uh, nevertheless, they're called spacewalks. Uh, they, are, they are not really a walk at all. It's at best a marathon uh, because it's, a, it's task after task after task, tightly choreographed on the ground first, rehearsed uh, 
in the pool in Houston several times and then executed in space with the two astronauts up there and usually there is another one that is uh, controlling as kind of uh, the, the EVA director is controlling step by step and making sure that uh, uh, the activity is uh, done uh, correctly. Today this person is in, sitting in Houston Mission Control in Houston and another astronaut is Shane Kimborough. And how long is it all going to take today, do you think? Well, the nominal plan is uh, six hours. Uh, this is always uh, what it is, uh, the spacewalks are targeted. So they actually put in stuff for uh, six hours uh, and uh, it usually takes a little bit more uh, in space and you may have a hiccup here and there. They can go uh, up to seven hour, I think the record has been seven hour and 40 minutes or something like that. Uh, usually if they are faster than the nominal uh, um, timeline and they are, uh, everything is going good, uh, they actually add, uh, take some more, they have the option of take some tasks from the next TVA and bring it to here. So uh, you, will, you will see, they make sure from the ground that they get, uh, that they are they will work uh, worth. Uh, so you were talking a lot about how the amount of planning that goes into these uh, spacewalks or EVAs and um, we're going to go to Valentina who's at the International Space University because I think she wants to know a little bit more about the sort of training for such a procedure. Uh, Valentina, take it away. Hi Paolo, uh, my question is uh, what did Luca train for most in the lead up to his spacewalk? Well, uh, uh, it's interesting because it used to be in the space shuttle era that each one of the spacewalk was really, really tightly rehearsed uh, in the pool uh, in Houston. In fact, uh, the rough uh, idea was that for each hour of spacewalk, they would do seven hours in the pool. So, or, or seven dives in the pool essentially at the end. So there was a lot of training. Well, today we don't have this uh, uh, luxury on the space station era. So what we do, and I've been, I've gone through the same uh, training, uh, you do a series of generic uh, dive in the pool where you actually rehearse each one of the 12 major mum functions that are I believe to that could happen uh, outside the space station, so you at least have seen one of these at least once, plus a bunch of other tasks. But you really want to train, and Luke has been trained on general uh, uh, skills, uh, so that whatever they throw at him is able to to take care of. And this is uh, what happened. Luke did uh, several dives in the pool, actually did the basic training from the pool, did the skills training, which is an advanced training, and then executed uh, uh, several uh, dives to get trained, it, but it did not train specifically on this EVA. Thank you. That's great, Paolo. Um, so this is Luca's very first spacewalk, and you were saying that you've uh, gone through a lot of the spacewalk training yourself, but Luca is the very first Italian spacewalker. How does that make you feel? There's a little bit of jealousy going on there? <laughs> well, uh, yes and no. I mean, uh, I did train for more than 10 years for, uh, for doing a spacewalk, and uh, the fate was that... Uh, I was never, for one reason or the other, assigned a nominal spacewalk. I was told, Paolo, don't worry, you're going to go on the station in six months. You are part of the spacewalk emergency team, so prepare your suit up there because something will surely go wrong on those six months. In fact, two months before we arrived, there was something that went wrong pretty serious outside the station. They had to go out four times. Uh, after we left, Another something else uh, uh, went wrong and they had to go out in emergency, but uh, during my six months we were too good apparently to the gods of space and never had uh, any opportunity to exercise this thing. Uh, I'm, um, I, look at look, look, uh, I look at Luca with a little bit of envy, but uh, I mean Luca is a great guy. Uh, he has done uh, a lot of training, he's very well qualified, he's doing very good and I'm just happy that uh, finally an Italian astronaut uh, managed to go out and do this very interesting and essential task. I still think, I still keep uh, 
uh, the record of being the first Italian that has done a long duration mission, he can have the first one of doing a spacewalk. So we've just had a, a live question in on YouTube, and it's from Mr. Subjugation, uh, interesting name, and he says, do you ever get homesick being in space, or is it all just too fun? Or busy, I imagine, well, as well. Well, uh, six months is a pretty long time, and uh, uh, I would say, though, that contrary to what uh, people think, uh, the time is very busy. You don't get bored. Uh, you don't. Uh, you never have a moment in which you are sitting there doing nothing. Because if you are sitting there doing nothing, you just go to the window and start looking down, start taking pictures, uh, which is uh, pretty amazing. So there is not enough time to do whatever you want to do. Uh, I never felt uh, homesick. Uh, I never felt I wanted to go home. I felt. I was a terrestrial guy, a terrestrial person. I felt that when I was looking at the planets, I really belonged there. But that uh, uh, did not uh, did not uh, want me. I mean, I, I was not feeling that I really needed to be leave space and go there. And I think it's probably easier these days. You know, when you were up on the International Space Station, you were answering people's questions, sending videos down. So there's still that feeling that you have a, a connection to the ground, I'm guessing. Well, you do have a strong connection to the ground. I mean, uh, uh, everything is done uh, from the ground to avoid that this isolation and confinement really gets to the crew. Uh, you talk the mission control, you have uh, the big brother watching you with cameras all over the place. Not, not, not really to watch you, it's just to help you in what you're doing. Uh, you, you have uh, internet, uh, email, uh, Twitter, I mean, you, you do have uh, so many things that uh, uh, will, not, will not make you feel you are alone, lost in space. Uh, and this is uh, really nice. It's a really nice feeling being up there. I think we're going to go to uh, David now, who's at Imperial College, because he wants to know a little bit more about the risks involved with spacewalks. David, put your question to Paolo. Hi, Paolo. Um, just wondering how how worried astronauts are about the risks of space debris, and is there anything you can do about it? Is there anything to mitigate the risks? Well, no. Uh, I mean, being in space per se, it's already risky. You are on an unforgiving environment, which is basically a hostile to life. Uh, you need to be inside the spacecraft, uh, otherwise you're going to die pretty quick. And when you go out in a spacewalk, you actually go out in a spacesuit, which is a small spacecraft. So you, you really don't go out of the spacecraft, you just change the spacecraft. Uh, uh, the space station has a shield, uh, which is uh, able to sustain uh, hits uh, that are relatively small, because for the big hits, uh, usually we, we know when they are coming, there are radars on the ground, and we actually move the station uh, if this would be the case. Now the small hits we can not really, really see them and the space station has a, um, a shield. Now you don't have the luxury of having this shield when you're out on a spacewalk. And so you accept uh, there is a little bit more of a risk that a small uh, uh, space uh, fragment, uh, meteorite or something like this comes and hits you. Uh, while uh, there is the risk, uh, the risk is very, very small, and so far in all the spacewalks that have been uh, conducted, there was never uh, was a case. In case this uh, would happen, um, the suit is made so that uh, an emergency, so if there is a hole in the suit, and a, an emergency system kicks in and starts uh, pressurizing the suit, uh, while the oxygen uh, is lost in space, there's, there's still this pressurization that takes over, and you do have uh, about uh, half an hour of time, uh, which is the time that you are required to come back into the airlock, and we do get trained for this. A great question, David. Um, I'd just like to ask a, a little bit further. You know, we've talked about the, um, the damage from space junk, but what about um, the other safe safety procedures so that you don't float away, so that you stay close to the International Space Station? What are the procedures involved um, with that, Paolo? Well, uh, Martin, first of all, we get uh, a lot of training, and uh, we go through what is called uh, tether protocols, uh, which is... Uh, 
essentially a mitigation on the probability that you go away from space. First of all, you don't walk during a spacewalk. You just move around using your head, passing from one handrail to the other. If you see the picture, you will see the yellow handrails. Those yellow handrails are put there in place, and they are yellow because they, they signifies that it's safe to touch them. So you, you are trained to always have a handrail somewhere in your reach. Uh, you should stay always close to structure so that you can always touch it. Uh, when you go to a um, uh, working work site, uh, you have a local tether, what is called a local tether, and you just use it to hang on to a handrail or to other attach point so that you can let the hand go and work. And if you would go away, you have this local tether, which is just, it's just a meter long, so it will keep you more or less in the area where you're supposed to work. Now, in case of a real, real problem, we do have another emergency last, uh, last uh, ditch uh, uh, thing to be used, uh, which is called a, 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 a tether. This tether is a, is a system mounted on a reel with a spool that uh, automatically is um, kept uh, taut. And, and we have this uh, 55 or 85 feet long tether that we can attach to station and just move around. Uh, essentially, we do ignore that we have it. I mean, you have to, to kind of uh, ignore that you have it. You don't use it at all. And it's simply sitting there in a stream case of emergency. Then uh, you can actually grab this tether and come back to station. But so far, uh, in all the spacewalks that, that happen, again, uh, there was never the um, need to, to use this uh, emergency retrieve uh, system. Well, that's, uh, that's good to hear, Paolo. Uh, to anyone who's just joined us, this is a James May's Head Squeeze Google Plus Hangout with the European Space Agency, and we're joined by astronaut Paolo Nespoli, who's live in Rome. We're going to go to the International Space University now to get a question from Su-Chan. Hello, hi. My question is, how can the astronauts communicate with the ground control center? Will they always keep communications with the ground during the spacewalks, which seems to last for almost seven hours? Thank you. Hi, Su Chan. Uh, hi, everybody, again at the International Space University. Great university, great course you have up there. Uh, I bet you're learning a lot. So, um, Communication protocol, it's one of the areas that we get a lot of training on because uh, obviously when you're talking to somebody through the radio, uh, you need to use a special uh, protocol uh, in order to cut down on the amount of communication, in order to be coincise, in order to express uh, what you want to say and, uh, and, and be careful on, on what's going on. Uh, so each one of the two astronauts have a radio inside their suit uh, with a backup, actually, so in case of a problem. And they are actually talking to a transmitter that is sitting on the station. All are outside the station. There are several antennas, so they can talk. Uh, uh, the signal can go to several antennas, so if they are hidden somewhere, they always can get in, in reach of an antenna. Then the station takes the signal and throws it over the space to ground down to the control center in Houston. And this is the way that the astronaut can talk. So right now there are three people mostly talking on radio, the two space walkers out there and one down uh, in uh, mission control. This is the way they, they really talk to them. It happens once in a while that uh, the communication are lost this is because the uh, space station is rotating around the Earth in order to communicate to ground, sends the signal up to a satellite that then bounces back on Earth. And, and so rotating around the Earth, the station loses uh, or, or once in a while needed to transition from one satellite to the other. And there is actually a little area near uh, uh, the Pacific, actually it's uh, in the Indian Ocean, that is actually not covered by transmission. So during the transition from one satellite to the other, or during this uh, special area, uh, which is called ZOE, Zone of Exclusions, the communication is lost. But we, again, we get trained uh, in order to make sure that uh, during those periods, uh, uh, nothing uh, uh, gets uh, crazy or gets lost. 
Uh, on the subject of uh, live communications, um, I can see stunning images coming in right now of the spacewalk going on live. Uh, absolutely fantastic. We've got a question from Twitter now from Jazz, who wants to know, do you have any special tips for any budding astronauts? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, any special tip for, from whom? For any aspiring astronauts. Ah, for an aspiring astronaut. Uh, well, actually, I... Um, it's it's interesting. A lot of people want to be astronaut, and a lot of people ask me, "So, what do I need to do to be an astronaut?" And and in fact, the qualifications that are required to be an astronaut are relatively simple. I say, relatively speaking, with you need a university degree, a technical uh, degree. Uh, you need to speak English at a very high level, and you need to have a normal uh, health uh, status. So. These are three relatively simple things, and and it makes uh, uh, then uh, a dif difficult or a difference on how people are selected. I don't have the magic uh, answer, uh, but I always tell people that they need to understand uh, their passions and follow them, follow their passion, whatever they are. I see Luca uh, now hanging out on the robotic arm, being transported in one part of the station, and he has almost nothing to do. So what did he do? He put, put out, took out the camera and started taking pictures. Great place to take uh, pictures there. And this is, for example, photography is one of the passion that I had when I was since when I was a kid. I kept it, and apparently photography has nothing to do with becoming an astronaut. But guess what? I really think that it made a difference, the fact that I was, I had a passion, that I followed it, and, uh, and I liked it, and this had an impact on me becoming an astronaut. So I tell everybody, yes, be good, get a technical degree, if you, that's, if you des so desire, get, uh, uh, learn English, and un any other language is pretty good, maintain your health uh, status, but also find your passions and follow them. Don't forget uh, to follow your passions. We're going to go back now to the International Space University again, and George wants to ask a little bit about the sun and how that can influence astronauts during spacewalks. Go ahead, George. Hi, Paolo. We've been watching the EVA, and as we've seen the ISS orbit Earth, it's gone from direct sunlight to shade. Can you tell us how the astronauts' pupils react to this change in light levels? Yes, uh, so it, um, the change between night and day is quite uh, dramatic uh, because you go from uh, deep night to uh, 12 o'clock uh, midday sun in few seconds. I mean, I think it takes like eight seconds to go from one extreme to the other. And, uh, and so, uh, obviously, your, um, your eye react pretty bad to this uh, uh, quick uh, change of uh, uh, light and uh, and therefore the the suit is has a kind of uh, a shield actually it has a a, a, a shield uh, that can be act manually activated uh, usually if you would hear the communication uh, space to ground you would hear the ground uh, team uh, telling people up there uh, warning them that the sun is coming up usually it, they usually tell them about uh, a couple of minutes before and then again like 30 seconds before. And what usually do, the astronauts uh, at that point uh, close their uh, uh, glare shield, uh, which is actually a very thin layer of gold uh, that blocks uh, radiation, uh, UVs and, uh, and other harmful uh, um, uh, radiation that are in space. And uh, they keep going. Usually, also in that uh, at that time, you actually take a moment, uh, watch your gloves, check your gloves, make sure that the gloves are intact. Uh, there are not uh, tears. Uh, there is nothing wrong with it. You actually take a quick look around you, uh, making sure that everything is attached properly. Nothing is uh, chaotically sitting in there, and then you keep going. Wow, there's a lot of things to, to think about when, uh, when you're doing a spacewalk from the sounds of it. It must be a lot of things going through Luca's mind um, to keep him on track, and I guess that's why the ground crew have to be very precise about what's going on. Uh, we've got another question now from Twitter. This is from Data Chick, and says, Do you have any different dreams on the station? Does it affect your sleeping? Well, 
This is a this is a good question that I get all the time, and my the answer is uh, that uh, uh, it did not affect uh, my sleeping, uh, except that uh, I was trying to sleep as less as possible so I could have time to do whatever I wanted. Uh, so I slept a little bit less than what I would sleep on uh, on the ground. I tried though to sleep enough so that uh, during the day I would not be overly tired. Uh, but the the dream uh, themselves, uh, at least for me, they did not change. I dreamed the usual things, and by the way, I don't usually remember my dreams. So uh, the only one of the difference though is that you have to get used to sleeping, kind of floating, falling asleep, uh, floating. Because here on the ground, we actually have gravity that uh, uh, makes us or let us assume a certain position, you know, head down or stomach down or whatever. And people cannot cannot assume their own position in space, so you have to get used to uh, to um, uh, uh, falling asleep, floating. As you have to get used when you wake up in the morning for the first days, the first weeks, I would say, you open your eyes and you have the distinctive feeling that you are upside down. So you start turning, you you start turning and and try to 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 ride up yourself, and of course nothing is happening creating a little bit of confusion and then it's like, oh yes, I'm in space. This is the normal feeling. Okay, okay, okay. I should I should stay calm and keep going. I can't imagine what that feels like, but I think we would all love to have that that feeling that oh oh no I yeah I am in space. Let's go to you as Simon now is at Imperial College and he wants to ask a bit of question about science in the ISS. Go on Dr. Simon Foster. Hi Paolo. Um, I was just wondering what you feel the ISS's uh, greatest contribution to science has been. Well, that, that is a question that I get uh, all the time because uh, people want to hear that we discover something exceptional, that we did find something like this. And, and unfortunately, I have to say that we don't have a single answer that covers everything. My personal view is that uh, Space Station is a great laboratory. It's the only one we have where it's possible to conduct experiments in microgravity. Uh, people all around the earth, uh, scientists, uh, research centers, university, can uh, come up with, uh, with experiments and they can actually be performed in space. And this is what happens uh, uh, this time. In the last increment, I was reading some statistics. They have done more than 240 experiments in six months. Uh, a lot of these things uh, seems uh, pretty trivial or a lot of these, these things do not seem to lead uh, anywhere. But it takes time before somebody doing basic research come up with something uh, that maybe at the moment is uh, actually not uh, not even thought as useful. It takes time before these uh, things are uh, uh, filtered down into society and they are used. I was last year in Cologne. There was the Association of Space Explorer meeting, and one of the scientists uh, uh, came up with the report that. Uh, uh, the story that salt is bad for your body uh, was actually documented for the first time uh, by an astronaut. Uh, of, of following an experiment that was done an astronaut 15 years ago, where they found things that uh, they could not explain, that they were counterintuitive, and uh, and they were not up to what the science, what the people, what the scientists thought at that moment. Uh, after that, uh, the, the 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 thought of uh, thought start going in, and eventually, now we know that uh, salt. So when you eat salt, it goes into your skin, and then later up on time, it will uh, conflict with the skeleton, start working on osteoporosis, and give a lot of problems, including heart and everything else. And all of this started long time ago with some of these experiments. So um, I'm. Uh, I, I, I think uh, on station there are many, many, many things that are done. We should look at all the papers, the technical papers that are written uh, month by month and published. Uh, there are so many things that come out of there. A lot of them I cannot even understand. You guys, uh, when you write on, on, on science, uh, uh, you guys are so... Uh, cryptic sometimes. Uh, you need to be an expert on biology or metallurgy or, or, or anything like this to really understand this little, little, what seem little things but have definite impact on what happened from then on 
in the understanding of this uh, part of the science. Thank you. Personally, Paolo, I'm very much looking forward to uh, new results from the AMS experiment because they've been very promising. Um, we've got time for one final question, and that's from YouTube. And James wants to know, what do you think the prospects of uh, going to Mars are with, you know, there's quite a buzz around that at the moment with certain proposed projects. Do you think that's realistic? Going to Mars, uh, hey, I, I really think uh, it would be in our capacity and capabilities uh, how our mean uh, as a human beings, as a, as a terrestrial people, it will be our uh, capability building a spacecraft and send uh, people to Mars. Uh, I think uh, realistically it will probably take uh, a good chunk of money and uh, 10 to 15 years if we want to send uh, uh, a human some people to Mars and get them back. Um, it does really require a lot of, of uh, technological uh, um, understanding. You know, taking or make, putting five, six, ten people into a spacecraft, sending them away for one, two, three years, because this is what it takes now, going and coming back from Mars. Uh, you know, giving them all they need to eat, uh, all they need to wear, all in, in, a, in a small environment, uh, think about all the water they need to use, putting everything into there and sending them out, uh, shield, shield them, uh, build a shielding for uh, radiation, which outside of, uh, if you go far away from Earth, uh, uh, are pretty dangerous and uh, uh, terrific. So this is very complicated, but we can actually do that. I'm pretty, I'm pretty um, uh, confident and we can do that when we find a way and the strength as a human species to do this uh, long uh, step. Today, uh, there are some people that say that going to Mars is not that difficult. It's more difficult to come back. So there are plans uh, by private companies to send a human being to Mars and leave them there to establish a new presence there. When I heard about this, I thought it was kind of crazy. But, you know, you think about it, this is not that different of what they were doing, uh, you know, 500 years ago when they were leaving uh, Europe and going and look for uh, uh, India, for the United States, uh, for Australia. I mean, not many people uh, came back and not many people were leaving thinking that they are going to come back. So we need to go back a little bit with the idea that exploring, uh, it's a very rewarding business a little bit um, dangerous uh, and, and when you go, you just go and you explore. That's what it means. You may not come back. Wow, what a wonderful perspective. Paolo, thank you for all of your answers. You've been absolutely fantastic as, uh, as usual. Um, of course, if you want to watch the spacewalk that Luca is doing right now, you can do that live at ESA.int. And uh, of course, subscribe to Head Squeeze to find out when hopefully we'll be talking to you again, Paolo. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you, everybody at ISU. Uh, thank you, Dr. Foster at the Imperial College of London. Thank you. I mean, you are so many. I cannot, uh, I, I don't have the capability of thanking everybody. Uh, but we'll keep, keep, look, keep looking, keep uh, being uh, involved, uh, keeping be. I mean, I, I, like, I like looking at these things because I'm thrown into space. Uh, my imagination go, go wild. And we need uh, once in a while to think in these terms to really make sure that we keep dreaming and we keep doing the impossible. Impossible man, Paolo, thank you.